for joining us tonight. I'm Kelly Soup along with Jamie Costello. You know, it's one thing to see it in pictures and in video, but it is another thing to see it in person up close. Look at this. Unbelievable. The, the footage that we're seeing here today is just incredible. And Elizabeth Worthington got a chance to visit the Key Bridge wreckage site today as the crane operations resumed after a wet and windy week. And she is uh, joining us right now live. Yeah, Jamie and Kelly, we saw when I was live at five, one of our pieces of lighting equipment went flying right in front of me. That's how windy it was. And now, just an hour later, it's sunny, there's no more rain, and the wind has died down significantly. And that's exactly the kind of back and forth that these salvage operators have, have, have been dealing with this entire week. You know, one minute they can be up in a crane and it's sunny and calm. And then a couple minutes later, storm clouds, storm clouds roll through and there's extremely strong wind gusts and maybe even lightning and they have to stop what they're doing. But today they got long enough of a break to restart the process of removing some of these bigger pieces of the wreckage. And today we got not only a close up look at that wreckage, but at the work to remove it as well. The Coast Guard took us on a vessel out to the site. Pictures don't do it justice. Today we got up close to the Key Bridge wreckage site. Thousands of tons of disconfigured metal sit on top of the dolly with the 23 men crew still inside. We also got up close to the salvage work. We were able to see crews cutting into the steel pieces of the Key Bridge sticking out of the Patapsco River. Engineers are using exothermic tools to cut the metal into quote bite sized pieces. Lightning paused those crane operations most of Tuesday and Wednesday. So far, only one piece has been removed. We saw it sitting on a barge today, waiting to be taken to a disposal site. That piece weighs 200 tons. It took 10 hours to get it out of the water. If we're talking bite-sized pieces, it was a pretty small bite, and the meal is huge. For comparison, the wreckage sitting on top of the dolly weighs three to four thousand tons. Underneath all of that wreckage, below the surface of the river, divers are still searching for the bodies of the four remaining victims. That's happening as the dive teams are conducting salvage operations. In that process, if we detect any sign or any even the slightest chance that there's something we need to continue to investigate that might be uh, some uh, a missing person or a piece of equipment that could possibly have a sign for more recovery efforts. We've got the Maryland State divers from the Maryland State Police to come in and be ready to go right there. On the day of the collapse, I said that we would stop at nothing to support these families. While all of this work continues, Governor Moore says some commercial activity is slowly returning to the Port of Baltimore. As of this morning, 75 containers that were rerouted to ports in New York and New Jersey arrived at our port. This is not a permanent solution. The 75 containers that we moved today represents less than 5% of the average number of containers that the port processes daily before the collapse. Less than 5%. So we still have a long road ahead of us to getting vessel traffic back up to full capacity, but we will get it back up to full capacity. So we mentioned the efforts to recover the bodies of the four remaining victims and the efforts to bring closure to the families. Well, Governor Moore said today a liaison has been appointed to provide a direct line of communication between the government, city and state leaders and the victims' families. He said during the initial two meetings this week that they had, they lasted a combined six hours. And there's an emergency response fund started by the city's uh, Office of Immigrant Affairs, and that has already raised more than $130,000. Reporting in Dundalk tonight, Elizabeth Worthington, WMAR 2 News.